I know I'm just laser beams, man. I appreciate that. Thank you.
Amen. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back, and it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Just uh, some of the announcements that I made this morning. Uh, uh, we've got the uh, business meeting coming up Wednesday, so be in prayer for that, and uh, hopefully we'll have Lord's Supper next week, uh, provided that we can uh, get everybody, uh, as far as the deacons, to be able to take part in it, but you be in prayer for that. And uh, also for OCC, we are collecting uh, boys' underwear. So if you uh, uh, would be able to help us with that, I know that'd be a great way to minister to uh, all the ones that'll be getting uh, uh, OCC boxes this year, shoe boxes this year, and pray for OCC as we're gearing up to uh, start another good year of um, just ministering to uh, uh, these children through the shoe box ministry. So be in prayer for that. Uh, just a, uh, 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 an announcement that I'd like to make. Uh, I just got a text where my uh, stepfather-in-law passed away just a few minutes ago. So uh, keep him in prayer, or keep the family in prayer, uh, uh, especially his wife, Charlene King, and, uh, and just the family. So just be in prayer for them, uh, and uh, uh, we know where he's at, and it's good to have that reassurance. But let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for the peace and comfort of knowing you. And Lord, that uh, Father in all things, that uh, uh, you're working your perfect will. And all things are working towards your perfect will, which is good and right and righteous. So Father, tonight I pray as uh, we gather here. <clears throat> Father, I do pray for my uh, in-laws that uh, you'll just have your hand upon them. But Father, also, I just pray for your presence in this place today. Uh, Lord, just let all other cares and concerns pass away and that uh, we keep our hearts and our minds uh, and our hearts uh, focused on you. Watch over us tonight, Lord. Lead God and direct us in this service and let your will be done. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This setup, I feel like I'm in my school with my laptop here teaching the boys so uh it's a little weird brother tom having having this set yeah up we're here. high tech today we're high tech tonight <laughs> uh do you want to remind y'all we this is uh september acts 1 8 will be have we started our margaret lackey uh state offerings um for the month of september and we'll have more info on that next sunday take out your hymn books turn over hymn number 138 at calvary we're going to sing all four stanzas Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the Lord I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything, now I gladly own him as my king, now my rapture soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, Pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, 
There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And look over to uh, the next hymn, hymn 139, At the Cross, we'll sing all five stanzas. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he default that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well, mine, the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for men the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Thus might I hide my blushing face while Calvary's cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt mine eyes to tears. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And look to the next hymn, hymn number 140, Down at the Cross, we'll sing all four stanzas. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where from cleansing from sin I cry, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so wondrously safe from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory To my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, 
I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. My heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me this evening to the book of Amos, chapter 3. Amos, chapter 3. And the title of my message this evening is God's Judgment on Israel. Now, as you've already seen and heard, we're going high-tech today for some reason. The, uh, uh, our connection with the Internet is down, so I'm going to have to uh, just go off the computer prompt, but that's okay. It's still the Word of God, and we're going to preach that tonight and uh, consider that tonight. Uh, where we're at right now in Amos chapter 3, uh, we're looking at God's judgment, our impending judgment. Now, if you remember, this isn't a time of turmoil for Israel. This is a time of great prosperity. This is the time when they were doing well. Uh, they were prospering economically, they were prospering as a people, and folks, that can be a dangerous place to be when everything is going good. You see, when everything's going bad, we have a tendency to talk to God a little bit more, a little bit more intensely, and uh, our, our prayers become real. But when things are going good, we have a tendency to think oftentimes uh, that everything, okay, God, I'm good right now, so uh, uh, I'm just going to try it on my own for a while. Your prayer life may slack off, your Devotion time may slack off because you think that uh, uh, you're good right now. Well, a lot of times that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to set you up and uh, get you away from talking to God and have you comfortable kind of uh, uh, straying a little bit from God 
and uh, thinking that things are okay and I don't need God as much. This is what Israel was doing. God had blessed them time and time again, but He also had expectations for them as a blessed people. And they blew it. They blew it a lot of times. And every time they blew it, they had to suffer the consequences for it. And when they realized that, hey, without God, we're nothing, that's when they repented and got right with God. And the cycle is still the same today for us as it was back then. When we are dependent upon God and we honor God, uh, God blesses us when we put Him first in all things. But when it's, uh, we get to a point where we think we're good, that we don't need God as much, and uh, we think we can make it on our own, that is a surefire recipe for destruction and failure. And folks, it didn't work out for the Israelites, and it's not working out for us today. Think about how blessed we used to be as a nation. When we bowed our knees, and when we honored God, and when we kept the Sabbath holy, I still remember uh, on Sunday, you couldn't buy liquor anywhere because they reverenced God. Even the companies, even the stores, uh, still, whether they were religious or not, they still honored God, uh, and they still honored the Sabbath day. Today, uh, the Sabbath is just another day. Uh, church is just a competition for all the businesses out there. And we treat God's day just as any other day. But that's not just uh, uh, God's day. Look at how we treat them today in uh, our uh, schools, in our universities, in our uh, government buildings. Uh, we've taken the Ten Commandments down. And instead of the law of God, it's the law of the jungle. Amen? Amen. And look at the shape that we're in because of it. Now, we may have money. We may prosper from a... Uh, economic sense, we may prosper from a uh, technological and academic and intellectual and all of that stuff, but as uh, my mom used to say, you're getting too big for your britches. And sometimes it takes a trip to the spiritual woodshed to remind us of who's in charge and who we should be giving reverence to. And church, I'm afraid that's where we're at right now with the state of our country. I think we have a trip to the spiritual woodshed and God is showing us you've gotten what you wanted and look at what it's doing for you. Look at what it's gotten you. And today we're in more trouble morally than we've ever been. So God has a word for that. God has a message for that and we see that in Amos. And we're going to look at why God was bringing judgment upon the people in Judah and in Israel in this divided kingdom not because of their lack of ability, but because their lack of obedience to God. So let's stand in honor and reverence of God's holy, inspired, infallible word tonight. As we begin in Amos chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, say, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out for, of his den if he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Proclaim in the palaces at Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble on the mountains of Samaria, see great tumults in her midst and the oppressed within her, for they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbers in their palaces. Let us pray. Father in heaven, bless the reading of your word. And Father, tonight what we see in these passages is a mirror image, a glimpse, Lord, uh, into the future of where we're at right now. And Father, we're a rebellious people. We are people who have forgotten the Lord that has blessed us in our country. And Father, tonight, I pray as you used Amos to sound the, uh, uh, the alarm and uh, spread the warning of impending judgment, that Father, you use me tonight and uh, uh, pastors all over uh, to proclaim your word and tell them there is only one hope for us. There's only one hope for our land. There's only one hope for our salvation, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
So, Father, tonight, let your words be my words. Let your thoughts be my thoughts. Let the name of Jesus be magnified through this broken vessel as I am. And may, Father, you increase while I decrease. And it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I want you to notice something towards the end of this passage. Amos said that God has used the prophets to reveal the secrets. You see, the things that have been hidden by the devil, the prophets have been able, through the revelation of God, to reveal. He's used that uh, specifically when it comes to Daniel and some of the prophets that he's used in the past. You know, the devil wants you to think that uh, everything is okay. He'll put blinders over your eyes and have you believing all is well. And that's one of the things that the prophet, especially Jeremiah, had to deal with is everybody uh, uh, out there that were false prophets were proclaiming peace and goodness and well-being, lulling the people into a spiritual slumber. People like Jeremiah were out there sounding the alarm and saying, no, that's not right. You have judgment coming upon you because of your sin. Now, the devil wants you to think, and he wants you to be comfortable in your sin and thinking that sin is okay as long as I'm not hurting anybody else. Listen, this is where Israel was at this time. They were prospering. They were not hurting anybody. They were doing well, but yet there were several fundamental errors that they had made in their relationship with God. And the first error, error that we see is that they ignored God's deliverance. Let's go back to... Verse 1, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. Now, here we go. They had forgotten the Lord of their salvation. Now, that sounds very familiar. These words that God gave to Amos to give to the Israelites, that sounds a whole, like, a whole lot like the words that God gave Moses on Sinai to proclaim to the Israelites, I am the Lord thy God who delivered you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. That was the very first commandment that God had uttered to Moses to give to the people in how they were to reverence God and place no one above him. I am the Lord your God. He gave them that reminder. And just before they entered into the land of promise, God again spoke to Moses, and he told Moses, Moses, you gather the men of the tribes of Israel, and you tell them this, that they are not to forget me, the God who delivered them out of Egypt, out of bondage. They are to remember me. You know what happens when you forget? You tend to start doing your own thing. One of the last things that my grandfather told me before I left for the boot camp in the military, and he was just as somber and just as serious as he could be, he didn't say, son, duck, son, don't volunteer for anything, son, don't do this or that or the other. He said, son, do not forget where you came from. Amen. And folks, I tell you, those are words that I keep in my heart today. Don't ever forget who you are and where you came from. Now that's important for you to remember not only as, as a family, uh, but it's also important for us to remember as the family of God. Because if you can't remember where you came from, you're not going to have any direction on where you're going. And this was the problem that the Israelites had. They had forgotten the very God that had delivered them out of bondage, who had saved them from the depths of despair and the depths of oppression. God did all of that. But you see, the Israelites, just as they did in the wilderness, had, uh, having a short memory, they had a short memory now. Things were going good, so they forgot God. And listen, when they forgot God, when they ignored God, they started dishonoring God. They started following worldly principles, worldly values, worldly ethics. They started following these false idols. And you see, the lure of the world caused them to rebel against God, to bring dishonor. Now, the Bible is clear on God's attitude towards rebellion. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. 
For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? In other words, a writer of Hebrews is saying, don't stray from, don't forget the one you serve. Because if we cannot uh, 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 hope to be able to escape trying to live a good life, guess what? We're not going to escape by ignoring the salvation of God. There is no way that we're going to be able to get a pass. There's no way that we're going to be able to have a, a, a stand before God and God said, well, you meant well, you did good, you did that, you did the other. The only thing the Lord wants to know is whether or not we had a relationship with Him, or the only thing that's going to matter is whether or not we had a relationship with Him. And folks, how can we neglect so great a salvation? You know, it boggles my mind that there are people out there who would neglect that salvation. I mean, when you think about it, what greater love could we have from anybody than the love that God gave us? There's no power greater than God. There's no love greater than God. There's no hope that is in any other but God. Where else are you going to go? My response has been like Peter's. When Jesus said, do you want to go too? Peter said, Lord, where else are we going to go? Everything else has failed. Technology medicine, everything that we try to amass today and build up and pat ourselves on the back towards is nothing in the presence of our holy God. So where else are you going to go, my friend, but God? I love that spiritual that we sing. Where could I go but to the Lord? He is the one who brings us what we need the most. But rejection. Rejecting, rejecting this salvation. What you're telling God is that I would rather live in eternal darkness. I would rather live with eternal sadness. I would rather live with eternal despair. I would rather live with eternal separation. And I would rather live with con uh, eternal condemnation. Now no one in their right mind would willingly choose something like that. So there has to be something wrong with the way people think. And the way people think today and the problem of the way that they're thinking is that they are thinking with carnal minds. Sin has blinded them. When you think about it, as Paul had mentioned once, that uh, when he was transformed, it was like scales falling off of his eyes. You see the world in a different light. I don't see things today that I, like I used to see them in the past before I came to know Jesus Christ. When He changed my heart, He changed my view. And now I don't see things through carnal lenses. I see things through spiritual lenses. And the question that I want to know is that whether or not it's, uh, it's spiritual or whether it's of the world. Because there are a lot of things today, church, that can deceive you, that will look good to the eye, that will seem good to the intellect, that will feel good to the heart. But I'm reminded of what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9, but the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? My friend, the only thing that matters is when I'm experiencing life, those experiences will either coincide with what the Bible says is right or it won't. And if it doesn't, it's sin. It's wrong. We need to flee from it. And even in the way that we think, I mean, Paul said that we're not to be conformed to this world. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You see, your heart's not the only thing that gets saved when the Holy Spirit enters into you. When a person's saved, their mind is saved. And if your mind is saved, your actions are going to be saved. Your want-tos are going to be saved. Everything in you is going to be saved. You're not the same anymore. And when you think about that, when you have received a total transformation, you look at things a whole lot differently. I don't want to be the Tom that I used to be before I came to know Jesus Christ. 
Oh, there were some things that I used to enjoy in the world that I thought would bring me pleasure and happiness and all of that. It didn't. I mean, it may be temporary, but uh, I wound up chasing after the world more and more, wanting more and more of the pleasures of the world. And it became a futile process. There's a time when I stopped searching and I found exactly what I needed. It's kind of like the woman at the well. When Jesus said, when you drink of this water, you're not going to thirst anymore. You drink from me. You take part in me. And you'll never want for anything else. And church's word was true back then and it's true today. I may not have all the earthly things that I want, but I have everything that I need in Jesus Christ. How many of you can say the same thing tonight? We have all that we need in Him. But also, the second error that they made is that they didn't walk with God. Look at verses uh, 3 and following. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he is no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secrets to His servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Now what is, what, what, what is He talking about here? Amos is talking about, if you are going to be a, a follower of God, if you are going to be a child of God, there can be no contradictions in your life. Just as natural as it is for a lion to roar, so too should a person of God live a godly life. They should have communion with God. Jesus spoke of this when He talked about abide in me. Abide means to go along with. That means in this life that we're living, Jesus is just as much a part of us as it is, and He's just as natural to us as breathing is to the physical side of us. There can be no separation for a Christian uh, apart from Jesus. Jesus said, just as the branches abide in the vine, that vine provides the source of life. That vine provides the source of productivity. That vine produces the source of vitality. What happens to a branch if it is cut off from the vine? It dies. It cannot live without the vine. And this is how Jesus described it. So too are you in me and I in you. I am the source of your life. I'm the source of your vitality. I'm the source of the fruit that you're going to be producing or that I expect you to produce. You living any other way is unnatural. It's unnatural for a, uh, 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 an apple to grow on a lemon tree. And it's unnatural for a Christian to live without the influence and without the witness and without abiding in Christ. Two people can't be companions if they are opposed to one another. A lion's natural function is to roar in the presence of prey and to voice victory once he has caught it. If there's no prey, there's no reason to function. Without Jesus, there is no reason for us to live. We cannot have life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly to you. Amen. So church, a, a person without Jesus Christ is nothing, has nothing has no future, no life, no hope, no joy. And as I've said before, God without man, He's still God. Man without God is nothing. He's like a branch that's been cut off and has withered and died on a barren ground. So Jesus is saying, in his uh, uh, depiction of it, or his example of abiding in him, the very same thing that Amos is saying, that God was saying through him. Listen, you can't live separate from me. You can't have one foot in the kingdom of heaven and the other on the earth. There can be no divided loyalties here. You're either going to be one or the other. And these Israelites, they had decided that they could call themselves uh, uh, children of God, but live pagan lives, and that was an offense to God. 
God is declaring that them being without Him, a step away from Him, is unnatural to them. Paul said in Philippians 3.17, They are living in opposition to the very purpose God had for Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a, a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, them." Paul is saying the same thing that Amos is saying, or God is saying through Amos. A path apart from God is a path to destruction. Now, my friend, there's times when we stray. And those times, I believe, are our most miserable. You want to see, someone's mis see someone in misery? You go talk to a person who professes Christ, but they're not living a Christ-like life. They are some of the most downtrodden. They are some of the most depressed. They are some of the most defeated individuals in the world. But you take a person who is walking with Christ, it makes no difference what circumstance they may face. They're going to have joy in their heart knowing that they've got God leading them every step of the way. Amen. Church, that's what it means to abide in Christ. And this is what Amos was saying when it came to abiding with God. You've got to walk with me. And finally... They were setting a bad example. Example. Look at verse 9. Proclaim in the palaces at Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. See great tumult in her midst and the oppressed within her. For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who stores up violence and robbery in their palaces. Listen, God told Amos to assemble all of these great nations. And see what God is about to do. You see, Israel had a, a wonderful opportunity. They had an opportunity to let other countries and other people know about their God, Jehovah. They were set apart for that very purpose. To be the salt and the light of the earth. To stand apart as God's people. There was a time, church... When the Hebrews first entered the land of promise that other countries, other nations quaked. Those tribes, those pagan tribes, when they heard that the Israelites were coming, they shook in fear. They reverenced God because they knew God was doing a great work within those, within those people. It was only when they tried to be like the world, when they uh, renounced God and uh, His power in their life, and they wanted to be like the world, did they fall into trouble with the world? The very ones that they tried to warm up to and be like were the ones who took them as slaves. And isn't that the way the devil works? You see, the devil will warm up to you, having you think that he has the answers, that his way is better. And then once you fall into it, you're then a slave to him. And you realize at that point, you never had it as good as you had when you were walking in step with God, Amen. when He went before you. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what has fellowship has right, with righteousness um, uh, and lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. What a promise. Amen. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Church, the only way He can be your God and you be His people is by giving Him lordship of all things. To be a Christ-like example in the way that you live. It's easy to live like the world. Just take away everything you've been taught and believed as a Christian and go out there and just live it up. But I can tell you right now, you're not going to find peace. You're not going to find joy. You're not going to find contentment. What you're going to find is disappointment. There are people who have left the church and they've gone out in the world thinking that things were better. And I've run into many of them, not just in this church, but other churches. 
And they're some of the most miserable individuals that I've ever seen because they are outside the fellowship and outside the lordship of God himself. Now, church, God has given us everything. Just as he gave the Israelites back in the Old Testament, they were blessed. They were set apart. There's nothing different today as it was back then. Now, Israel squandered those opportunities and those blessings. And they wound up as slaves. They wound up in turmoil. They wound up in conflict. They had no peace, no rest. That's what happens when you live outside the authority of the Good Shepherd. But my friend, when you start living the life of a Christian, you abide in Him. You don't neglect the salvation that He's given you. And you walk with Him and you be that example that He has called you to be and me to be. And church, we're going to have that life that He promised and we're going to have it more abundantly. Amen. Listen, Jesus gave His life for a purpose. It was to reconcile us with God so that He could be our God and we could be His people. How are you doing or how are you giving honor to that sacrifice today? Let's stand and have a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Father, thank you for the salvation that came down to man. Father, thank you for abiding with us. That Father, even though we're not worthy, you decided to love us anyway, and you sent your son to die for us. So Father, today I pray for those that are straying. Father, I pray for those who are struggling. Father, I pray for our country that has, uh, Father, taken the way of Israel that have decided that they would rather have the world than you. And Father, back then you didn't give them a pass and you're not going to give us a pass. So Father, I pray as your word tells us that we will confess our sins, repent of our sins. Father, that we will pray and seek your face and only then will you heal our land and heal us. Father, tonight we thank you for your power and your glory that you're still seated on your throne no matter what may happen. So, Father, tonight I pray as the invitation is given, let your spirit move in and among these people. And, Father, let them make Jesus Lord of all their lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You come. Number 300. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus. Do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week in the Lord. Come on back Wednesday for prayer meeting and uh, business meeting. And until then, you tell someone about Jesus. Brother Sonny, would you close us in prayer?